the day. Why? Well, that, that meditation is so difficult. That it's so difficult. When I said it's not difficult at all, the easiest, most simple thing. But we have to make it difficult. Because everybody is so difficult that the simple things are incomprehensible to difficult, complex, fascinating human beings like yourself. <laughs> so, I'll try to make this basin as difficult and as incomprehensible as possible. <laughs> Starting out with the just, uh, I usually just, on uh, this particular first, uh, after the first day of meditation, I like to usually talk on the ten um, barometers, which <coughs> means, barometers, Pali word for like perfections or virtues, or qualities that are necessary for enlightenment. And without these barometers, uh, and of course we um, we will not be able to understand, comprehend the Dhamma. But like m- many people in, in Asia, as well as in the West, conceive these barometers as being as if they didn't have any connection to them yet. And they had to spend the next ten lifetimes developing these barometers, thus putting off their attempts at complete and full enlightenment in this lifetime. But the Buddha teaching of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, if one can comprehend that teaching, one can at least and have the opportunity to listen to it and practice, so that means your barome- you have enough barometers enough of that to at least be in situations where it's being taught and uh, have the opportunity to practice and to comprehend it. Now the the first one listed is called Dana Baramita, which is the uh, charitableness, the act of giving. Uh, now, charity has, uh, dana has this, this gesture of giving out like that. It's an opening out. And that very gesture, physical gesture itself, uh, is something important for us all to develop. An outgoing gesture of charitable, uh, of being charitable to others. To give what we can of our wealth and possessions to those who are without to be able to share uh, our things with other beings. Now without that, you see, the gesture of taking and getting, grasping, is like this. You know, you're trying to hold on and take everything for yourself. Trying to... That's why I was saying last night, this attitude of attainment, of achievement, of getting, of gaining, is... Uh, is not suitable for practice of the Dharma. It's, uh, it's that's suitable for worldly wealth and power. But for the Dharma, this gesture of giving out, the, the gesture of dana, of charity, is more useful. Is is necessary. Now, in countries like Thailand, that are very much uh, this this attitude of charity is highly praised and encouraged in that society, especially to the um, religious seekers and monks and nuns that uh, live by the discipline set down by the Buddha. So that in Thailand you have a whole society, nearly a whole society that supports, respects and encourages those seekers of the truth. And that is really quite remarkable in this day and age that that uh, that still exists at a time where the attitudes more are 
to get for yourself. Take what you can for your own needs, not worry about anyone else. Now this was the Baramita in the, in the uh, Jataka stories, the, the stories about the lives of the previous lives of the Buddha, the, the last previous life before he was born as Gotama was, he was called uh, Vesantara, the Bodhisattva Vesantara, Thai of Patvesandorn. And uh, Patvesandorn was perfected this, this uh, particular Baramita. This is one of the favorite stories of the Thais, and every year they have a festival in many of the temples in which the story of uh, Way Santra is recited. And it's the, uh, to a Western mind, this story is, is uh, somewhat hard to take, hard to understand, because such charitableness as Way Santra seems almost to be bordering on the absurd. <laughs> in the minds of Western, <laughs> because Wei Santra was so charitable he gave away his wife and children, not to mention his white elephant. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you can see why. The Westerners have a hard time with this particular stuff. <laughs> uh, I know it's the white elephant that boggles your mind. My <laughs> uh, all these so stories do have a significant meaning in the, in the in a symbolic meaning in a religious way in that even we have to relinquish and give up even that which is most we most cherish um, our possessions, valuables even our relationships we have to be able to let go and not cling to even those we love and are very attached to This doesn't mean to get rid of them. Like in the end, it all comes out uh, very happily. The Way Santra, because of his virtue and his resolution in keeping his his vow of charitability, uh, does get the, get it all back in the end. Wife, children, elephant, kingdom, everything. That's so a happy ending. Now just regard this also as like not only here at the center, the Insight Society, but also in your own life, in wherever you live. This attitude of dana is, is a way of, of uh, integrating practice into daily life. To uh, say, use your mindfulness and wisdom to observe how much you need, how much you can give to others who need, uh, not to just spend your life accumulating uh, wealth, possessions, and everything just for, your, just for some sense of uh, desire for your own, own concern, concern for your own particular safety and security. Like even develop the, the habit of, say, putting in coins in little charity boxes when you go into churches or, or uh, the blind people or beggars or whatever just uh, just the just the action itself is useful in the world training yourself not to to look down on uh, those who are without but to they want to help and be concerned giving what you can uh, of your own possessions In the bhikkhu sangha, they like the offering of food here in, in the in the center. 
is an actual movement from you to the to the alms bowl of a monk. I mean, you might think, well, I didn't prepare the food, I didn't buy the food, I didn't. <laughs> well, don't be so concerned with having everything absolutely pure and perfect. But just the actual movement of giving has its own profound effect on our lives. So that that's one reason why the the uh, in this uh, retreat here we are asking or uh, recommending anyway those to offer things to make that as a kind of movement out uh, outward to the monks uh, to not just be here uh, to get something from the center or from the monks as people here not to just feel you came here to get or to achieve but you came here to give is part of the training, is giving, giving even in tiny little amounts, or in great amounts, or in moderate amounts, whatever. Just like the, the putting the food in the in the arms bowl is a is a development in that direction. In the uh, in uh, London, we have this Buddhist society. It was established about fifty, sixty years ago by a very famous Buddhist. Uh, Mr. Christmas Humphreys and they have a summer school there every summer they it's been it's a Buddhist British Buddhist tradition by now it's been going on for 30 years and this summer school um, say three or four years ago uh, um, they when they invited uh, monks to say teach at it the monks were more or less uh, just treated like uh, lecturers or teachers uh, and they didn't feel any need to say establish a relationship with the monks as, as monks so the monks were kind of ate with the, with the people and, and uh, were not in any way the, the people in the Buddhist side didn't seem at all concerned about offering or giving to monks as such they thought it was all silliness they didn't want any of that in Britain but now uh, they've uh, they're beginning to find uh, this a, a pleasurable thing. Like three years ago, they invited me to teach there for two weeks, and I said I'd only go if they promised to give me alms food and one meal a day of alms food. And so they looked a bit disgruntled and said, "Well, all right, if that's if that's <laughs> what we have to do." <laughs> If I was being a fuss budget, then uh, during that two weeks, I noticed the line kept. At first, there was just two people kind of offering food, looking a bit embarrassed by it all. By the end of the two weeks, <laughs> the line was so long. I had to. We had to. Uh, I couldn't possibly have eaten that much food. We had to carry it in, in uh, shopping bags back to. Uh, we were living in London at the time for the other monks and the, the people found it's a, a kind of a blessing a joyous thing to do they didn't find it such a annoying or fussy detail another time some, some, someone came to a friend of mine an English friend came to Thailand to see me and and he, uh, when I went on the alms round in the morning, he wanted to walk behind me and kind of just watch what was going on. So I consented to that, and he followed me. And when we came back, he said, that was really one of the most inspiring things I've ever witnessed. He said, that Bindabata or alms round. And he was one of these kind of um, trendy Englishmen who, like, who would probably go to a place like the Esselin Institute and whatnot, if he lived in America. And in England, he, he was in these kind of encounter groups and, and things of this nature. And then he said, he said, now I know, now I really know what encounter means after seeing that. The encountering of, of a devoted and good-hearted lay person offering food to a religious mendicant. And in that very exchange is 
in that moment of offering and receiving is very good kind of action in the world at that moment in which uh, something skillful and something good is going on. So, this is, uh, Dhana Baramita is, a, is the most important one to develop in our lives uh, in, uh, for the welfare of our own practice as well as for the welfare of other beings. Now, the second Baramita is the Sila, called Sila Baramita, and this is the, uh, translated as morality. Now, morality sometimes has a ring to Americans as being something uh, restrictive and prudish and narrow-minded, intolerant, and so forth, because we've, uh, morality has been identified with kind of a closed-minded conservatism with prudery. But in Buddhism, the Buddhist morality is a refraining from acting on evil impulses with bodily action or speech. Immoral, uh, immorality doesn't, does not have to do with thinking. It has to do with action and speech. So that the Sila Baramita is developed by refraining from using our bodies and our speech for doing that which is unkind or cruel, uh, dishonest, exploitive, insensitive, inconsiderate, mean, and selfish. You say, well, what is that? Say, well, I, yesterday you took the, the Sila, the, the, refraining from killing, intentionally killing uh, any living being. Now this is important, and Bud- Buddha always made it clear, it's the intention, not the uh, action so much. Like sometimes we accidentally kill something, a step on an ant or, or something of this nature, which can't be helped. But to refrain from intentionally killing anything, any living being, to refrain from taking things that don't belong to us and stealing. Or we can, like a monk, refrain from taking anything that's not given to him. So that uh, I know from my own experience that I tended to kind of pick up things and before. I tended to, um, when I see things that attracted me, I just grab them and look at them. Well, I had no intention of stealing them, but it wasn't a particularly good habit just to be pulled out and to pick up things that don't belong to you. Uh, so, in, in the monastic life, we always train ourselves not to do that. So that things, say, maybe some interesting, fascinating, lovely things are around uh, objects uh, that we might like to pick up, but we refrain from doing it because they haven't been given to us. If they've been given to us, then we can uh, keep them or or look at them, use, uh, use them. And this is a refinement of that particular <coughs> rule. It also helps to prevent uh, looking around at other people's uh, lovely uh, possessions and coveting them. Because like when you walk down uh, into the town in, on the streets in, in London, where they have uh, displays of beautiful displays of goods, uh, we refrain from being pulled into that. We, we don't seek to look or touch or admire all the worldly goods. This is a, a way of training or perfecting sila. But in the, in the Buddhist uh, ways of teaching, sila is our guidelines more than absolute rules. So, we can, uh, like for lay people, sometimes the interpretation has to be on a court level, just not stealing something, intentionally stealing. But we can also refine that particular precept to, say, refrain from touching or grasping things that are not given to us. Then the uh, third precept is about, uh, for lay people, for householders, it's Dhamma Samicha, which is uh, refraining from uh, infidelity. 
uh, promiscuity or refraining from the misuse of sexuality uh, in which we misuse our bodies or the bodies of others just for lustful or uh, greedy uh, purposes without being responsible or considerate or sensitive to ourselves or to others. Uh, sexuality sometimes we don't respect our, even our own body. We misuse it a lot and, and exploit it. Try to get as much pleasure out of it as we can uh, without understanding the limitations of it or how to use it appropriately. Then for the eight precepts, it's a, a celibate, uh, celibate precept of refraining from any in, intentional erotic uh, type of behavior, which we r- r- totally refrain from uh, uh, any kind of sexual behavior at all. Then the Mutsawada precept of refraining from telling lies. Now, lying is, is uh, uh, we know that when, when we lie, when we don't tell the truth, when we exaggerate or gossip, just try to sit down and meditate after you do that. See what happens to your mind. You just told a lie, a big lie, or even a little one. See how much peace of mind you get when you sit down to meditate. And you know the results, the unpleasant results of, of lying. And this we refine more, uh, if you know, as just to avoid uh, heedless speech, gossiping about others, um, exaggerating things. And then the the uh, fifth is the suramerayo, refraining from drugs, taking drugs uh, that change consciousness and alcoholic drinks, so forth. Uh, these sila is a, this is a, a, a refraining precept rather than a, a doing. It means refraining from. Doesn't necessarily imply doing anything. The dana is the actual good action, isn't it? Developing the dana is a charitable, loving action, outgoing action, kindness to uh, other beings. And then the sila is the refraining from evil actions, selfish actions uh, in the world with our, with our body and speech. Now the third um, Bharamita is called Nekama, which is renunciation. Nekama Bharamita. Now that, those uh, are like the last three that you took, the not eating a meal in the afternoon, not uh, going to shows, dancing, singing, playing games, not to seek uh, unusual amounts of sleep as a way of escaping or or seeking out comfort uh, in order to uh, get lost in ease and luxury. So they say these are more like renunciate precepts. And this you can also use in your own lives to reflect on the way you live your life, how much of your life is really conducive towards spiritual development and how much of it is not conducive. It's up to you to decide. You have to examine and look at and be aware of how you're living your life and be responsible for it. And so the Nekama Bhamita is developed through say, really looking, being honest about the way you're living and renouncing that which is not particularly useful or conducive towards the spiritual life. If your if your goal is enlightenment, then this is what you have to do. If it's not, then you don't have to. It's up, it's, uh, up to you. But many people fill their lives with useless activities, just busy, busy, uh, just trying to kill time, doing something, watching television, uh, drinking, going to <coughs> bars, uh, just running around, heedlessly just living one's life, doing this, doing that, not 
because any of these things need be done, or even that because we want to do them, but because we're just so heedless and caught up, wound up, that we live our lives in this very uh, kind of habitual flurry. And if you're one of those people, it's time to investigate more carefully on the way you're living and see and, and develop a style of life that is more conducive to calm, to peace, tranquility. Now the next two paramitas are panya and virya, and these are uh, like panya in this particular case is more like worldly wisdom, uh, common sense. Uh, having uh, having some intelligence in your life, using your intelligence to reflect on what on what's good to do, what isn't good to do, uh, how to uh, what brings uh, success, what brings failure, what brings happiness, what brings suffering. To have use this discriminative faculty, uh, the intellect, in a in a for a. Uh, in a good way, in a skillful way, rather than just being caught an obsessed thinker, an obsessed uh, intellectual, and just seeks escape through thinking about things, reading books. So, Panya Bharamita means using thought, concepts, the intellect, skillfully for things that are worth doing, worth thinking about. And combined with this is the virya parameta of effort, or putting effort into what we're doing. Act not just thinking about life and think, having ideals and ideas and plans and schemes and never doing anything. Like if you have um, uh, a, lo- uh, a lot of intellectual ability, sometimes you have no, you can't get anything done because you think about doing things, but because of a lack of virya or effort in your life, you you can think too much about things to the point where they all seem like not worth doing, or you you can become very pessimistic and think, well, it will never work, I won't even bother to try it. So if you're one of those who dreams, idealizes, and then never gets anything done, it's because of a lack of this virya, which is the kind of doing something, finding out, using the panya, or the wisdom, to figure out what's worth doing, and then doing it. See, and learning from your successes and failures. If you have a lot of virya, but not enough panya, it means you... You're one of those people that just go out and do things without reflecting on whether it's worth doing or not. You believe anybody. To somebody will say, why don't you do this? So you do it. You just rush around doing things, not knowing why or if it's worth doing. So these are a balance for each other. The, the passive and active, the intelligence and the faith, the, uh, the uh, wisdom and the effort. Now the next one is uh, Kanti Baramita, which means patient endurance. Um, without any patient endurance, of course, we, uh, we w- couldn't possibly meditate. Meditation, like sitting and all this, things, is developing a, a kind of patience and endurance. You have to endure through that which is unpleasant or painful or boring, tedious. If you know Kanti Baramita in your life, you tend to just react to things. When something becomes unpleasant, or boring, painful, you just leave it, get away, run away. The, when you become disillusioned with somebody or something, you just leave it and run away. You don't endure through the seemingly unendurable. Now, it doesn't take any patience or, endure, or endurance to, uh, say, endure through pleasure, does it? Something that's fun, pleasurable, exciting, and interesting. 
You can't say, I had to endure through that wonderful show, terribly exciting, fascinating show. I had to endure. Or through a good meal, really delicious meal. I had to just sit there and patiently endure through that. <laughs> but sometimes we have to endure through the pain, like sitting here for an hour. When we want to leave, we want to get up, we want to move, we want to go away. Endure through monotony or depression or doubt or despair. All these conditions we would like to run away from. We'd like to annihilate and destroy. When I went to Wat Pa Pong <coughs> in the first time, I couldn't speak the language at all. I couldn't understand it. And they all spoke Lao, uh, Northeast Thai, which is a Lao, a, a Laotian dialect. And they, uh, and I would, and you, it was such a strict monastery, you had to sit there. Sometimes, uh, in those days, Ajahn Chah would, could go on for three or four hours. You just sit like this in this Thai posture where your leg is off to one side. And I found that just five minutes of sitting like this in those days excruciating. And so, uh, I, 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 when I arrived, I thought, well, I'm sure that because I can't understand the language and I'm a foreigner, that I'll have special considerations and they'll let me out of this tedious kind of thing where one has to sit and listen. And all, all the other monks can understand what he's saying, so it's very interesting for them. But for me, I can't understand it. My body just isn't uh, flexible enough to sit like that for over five minutes. And all are very good reasons, aren't they? <laughs> So I went to Ajahn Chah and I told him, I gave him these reasons, he said, it doesn't make any difference, just <laughs> you have to do the same as all the others. I thought, not being very considerate, I, I thought, well, I, I, I think I'll leave. <laughs> Go uh, be appreciated. <laughs> but something in me uh, convinced me to stay on, at least for a little while. I was there for ten years, actually. The, uh, and learned to endure through what seemingly was unendurable. And at first, it was uh, just sitting like this, and then uh, everything is quite unscheduled in Thailand. They're not, they aren't like the Americans that go by the clock and have everything, this hour is for this, next hour is for that, and so forth. It's all very, just when it's time to do, get up and leave, we get up and leave, and so forth. So that your sense of organization and, and punctuality is, is not uh, the same. So you never knew how long Ajahn Chah was going to talk. And so you start anticipating. I know he's, going, he's in, for a lo- in for a long one this evening. Of course, I couldn't understand what, what he was saying either. I determined in my mind to endure, make it a practice of patient endurance. The only thing one could do in such a situation. But it was very wor- uh, worthwhile. It was a, a lesson that I benefited from uh, as, as, as Ajahn Chah would sit on a high seat and I'd radiate hatred, hate vibes out to that high seat. <laughs> and sometimes I can just see that the body just be red with, with rage and fury. But uh, I kept watching it, enduring this, this, this rage because one could see that it it was a natural kind of of habit I developed of when I couldn't do what I wanted and was tied down to something limited and restricted and couldn't get my own way 
<coughs> and had to conform to something I didn't particularly enjoy doing, uh, that anger arose. Terrible anger. Now, I seldom ever had when I was a layman. But through that watching and observing, that tendency started to fade. And I found out after a few years that well, my bad temper almost seemed to go away. It didn't, didn't seem to bother me anymore. It's the conditions for it uh, were fading. We still had to do things. One time, I remember Ajahn Chah kept me up sitting till about three or four o'clock in the morning. We started, we chant, we had every fortnight, every two weeks, we had to chant the, the um, 227 rules, which was boring enough. And then you, <laughs> after the 227 rules had been chanted, you, you, you usually you had to, you could get up and leave. But that particular day, there was another monk from some other monastery there, and Ajahn Chah and that monk sat there and started just talking, laughing, looked totally unserious and foolish. And I was waiting for them to ring the bell to dismiss us. And it didn't ring. And we met about six in the afternoon, in the evening, and about ten in the evening, still didn't ring. And then twelve in the Midnight. And this anticipation, waiting for the bell to ring. When is it? When is he going to ring? And then the, these two monks just chatting and laughing, telling jokes. Just very aggravating. But what it did was, after a while, I just let, let it go. I stopped resisting. And, and in that letting go and, and non-resistance, I felt very much at ease. And about three or four o'clock in the morning, the, the bell rang. And I was really peaceful and content. And as I bowed to Ajahn Chah, he looked at me with a mischievous glint. <laughs> 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 but there was no anger in, in me. I was perfectly at ease. I was, really, I was quite grateful, in fact, for his uh, kindness in torturing me like that. <laughs> So in the say here during this retreat, see even these opportunities where you are bored, disillusioned, pain, not as <clears throat> just watch the mind, what happens to the mind. You know, observe the irritation or the rage or the proliferations that go on, the conceptual proliferation. Just be aware of those. Because you're, you're now one who is watching and listening, looking at the way things are, not trying to become <coughs> a good meditator, a saint, a Buddha, trying to become this or that. That's a worldly attitude, becoming. The Dharma attitude is being. So being aware that these are changing conditions and not self. Now, uh, after the Kanti Baramita is listed the Satcha, Baramita and Satya is honesty and truthfulness. And this is very important because we need to have a, a really profound uh, uh, kind of honesty with ourselves, our intentions for what we're doing. Sometimes we tend to ignore or lie or cheat or even with ourselves, not be quite clear in our minds of what we're doing. So we tend to do things uh, sometimes just out of habit or just rational, kind of lazy rationalizations, justifications. So this is a, a lack of such a baramita. Like intention, knowing one's intention. Now that isn't quite as complicated as it sounds. Like Somebody asked me the, the other day about 
digging in the garden because their son is, they dug up a worm or cut a worm in two and was that an offense against the precept? I said, was your intention to cut the worm in two? He said, no. What was your intention? Well, it was to help the garden. Said, well, then there's no offense. But you have to be honest about this. If you go out in the garden to kill worms, that's... <laughs> Like meat eating, uh, you say you you eat meat. Well, you should be vegetarian because you're encouraging people to kill animals by eating meat. I say, well, I don't encourage animals. I don't encourage killing of animals. My intention for eating the meat is not to eat animals or joy at eating animal flesh. But the intention for eating the meal is uh, for nourishment and eating food that's been offered without uh, demanding any kind of special food. Now the intention is to make oneself easy to take care of in accepting the food that's offered. The intention is not to eat meat. You see, that's the difference. Now, but if I'm lying about that, I really want to eat meat. So... I, I just justify my carnivorous uh, obsessions when saying, well, the Buddha didn't say anything. He said, it's all right for monks to eat meat, so it's all right for monks to eat meat. And so telling the lay people, they say, what do you want to eat? They say, I want to eat meat. Steaks and roasts. Kill me a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> So this intention is, is uh, you know, one has to be honest about with, with oneself. Now, honesty also doesn't mean that you have to always give yourself the worst possible intention. Like some people think that by being terribly honest means they always have to think the worst thing about themselves. So they, whatever is the worst alternative, they think, that's what I really am, and then I think that's being very honest and straight with yourself. But you have to use your intelligence. You have to, this isn't a, trying to decide, just, you know, thinking to the lowest level just because you, you're too uh, lazy and too uh, unconfident to recognize the good qualities that you have. Such also is recognizing that which is good in yourself, that which is honest and sincere and, and uh, uh, trying to do the right thing, like virtue and, and is kind and so forth. Some people say, well, I don't, I'm, I'm really no good, rotten so-and-so, selfish and mean, and they aren't at all. They just, they think that's being very honest because they're afraid to admit any, uh, they, to, to really look at their authors at a good side. Then there's the other extreme of always giving yourself the best description and ignoring any faults, laziness, lack of honesty. So such a maramita is the really, really looking at closely your intention not in, in order to come up with some conclusion about who you are or what you should be, but just observing the way you tend to live with yourself and with others. The next one is called Aditana. And this means resolution, being resolute. Now if you have no Aditana Paramita, that means you you start something, and then when you get bored with it, you give it up. You can't stay with anything. When it becomes uninteresting or some disillusion with it, you stop. You, 
maybe you start, I vow, I resolve to practice uh, meditation every morning for half an hour, maybe reasonable resolution. And then you do it one day, and the next day, third day you don't, then you give it up. That's a lack of resolution. But to be, to develop resolution in your life, you have to also use, you have to be a clever person. And some people make resolutions that are just too extreme. Like saying, I will meditate for half an hour every morning for the rest of my life. Or maybe something, I will meditate five hours every day for the rest of my life. That's what you make resolutions like that when you're terribly inspired, like coming off a meditation retreat. And then when you get after the after the inspiration and the high is lost then suddenly you find you can't even meditate for five minutes every day. <laughs> and especially if you if you compare your resolution with the what with the reality <coughs> of what you're doing, it you seem hopeless. You think I have no <clears throat> I'm too weak, I'm worthless, I have no kind of discipline, can't have no willpower. <coughs> so, in developing resolve or aditana, first of all, know what you can do. What you can do without any great uh, resolution, like you bands of time that you can easily succeed at, like sitting, say, for half an hour in the morning. Or if, if you can't manage half an hour, like just ten minutes, set a period of time in which you, will, which you <coughs> find that you can do it, to know, first of all, what you can do. This is using your panya, your wisdom. And then resolving to do that for, say, a, a month or a couple of weeks or whatever, for a span of time that you can manage, not for the rest of your life. And then seeing how you do, how successful you are. But be making it firm in your mind to do it, and and be in a reasonable way. Not making a grandiose resolution that you cannot possibly keep to. Then, as you find out what you can do, and how, and you, then you can say ex, uh, extend the period of time, do it in that way, because this isn't a practice in order to get there all at one jump, try to get rid of evil and faults and become good, but it's the practice of wisdom, mindfulness. We're not. None of us are. Tr- uh, need to become anything, like if you, one of your friends is a very kind of dedicated meditator and he says, I sit for three hours every day, no matter what happens, the house catches on fire, telephone rings, whatever happens, I will not budge from my posture. And you know that he, he will not budge, he's just so firm and resolute. And then you think, well, I budge every, every two minutes the house is on fire, I budge. <laughs> now remember, we're not trying to become like someone else or attain an ideal, like becoming an ideal, but of very humbly, very uh, determinedly looking at the way things are.
in the monastic life, we have all kinds of aditanas that we do. The Buddha thought up this, this, um, this, uh, left us with this discipline in which is, we, we, uh, develop aditana baramita. <clears throat> and aditana is a be resol- resolving, making resolutions, uh, but reasonably so. Like Ajahn Chah wouldn't even let us resolve, make a resolution to be a monk our whole life. When bhikkhus, when they're very full of faith and inspiration, we go, I want to make a resolution to be a bhikkhu my whole life. He says, you don't, you don't know the future. <laughs> don't, don't make resolutions for a whole life. But use the, uh, the aditana for developing awareness right now when you see that you're one who's irresolute and wavers and vacillates and can't do anything then develop aditana in a reasonable way you find you know do it so that you can keep resolution use your intelligence to know what you are capable of doing Then, once you know what you can do, then you can develop beyond that, if necessary. Now, the last two barometers are the metta, that the venerable uh, Cambodian monk uh, is talking about, and uh, the barometer of upeka, which is like equanimity or humility. So metta is a uh, translated uh, not too accurately as loving kindness, uh, because loving the word love in the English language is a bit too powerful a word. In we use love in English for the word like. We say I love. McDonald's hamburgers. <laughs> that means you like them a lot. <laughs> you wouldn't say I have meta for McDonald's hamburgers <laughs> unless you hated them. <laughs> <laughs> so actually I prefer knowing uh, teaching in England where people when I went to England I asked people there do you pra- practice metta and they say oh we can't stand metta <laughs> what do you mean they say, well it's, uh, it's kind of false isn't it you're saying I love my enemies I love Myself, I love uh, all these. It's kind of like being terribly sentimental and and uh, a bit sickening when you don't really mean it. <laughs> uh, English kind of uh, feel aversion for that. It's like just being rather uh, silly, saying you love, just saying you love things that you don't love at all, because the word love in English implies liking or being attracted toward. When you love something, you're attracted toward it, aren't you? McDonald's hamburgers, you're attracted toward it. When you see a, some, someone you love, you're attracted toward them. You want to go to them. But metta is a kind of, of it's more like kindness. Just the word kindness or not dwelling in aversion on that which is unpleasant. Like, say, an enemy, or someone who's hurt you, or insulted you, someone you, you do not like at all. You feel no attraction toward. You feel, whenever you see that person, you want to walk away from them. You want to go away. You don't want to walk toward them. You're repelled by them. But you can have metta for them, which doesn't mean you love them, but means you are kind. And if you, if they need help, you help them. 
And you don't dwell on aversion. You don't go around talking about them and spreading bad rumors and and dwelling uh, in your mind of they did this and then they did that and they're no good and they shouldn't they don't deserve to live <laughs> that kind of proliferation you you refrain from doing. Now this metta also applies uh, toward yourself. When we when we have metta for ourselves means that we don't say I love me. It means we don't dwell in aversion on ourselves, on this body or the conditions of our mind. We tend to be very self-critical. You know, I'm too lazy, I'm too weak, I'm not strong enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not beautiful enough, I'm not intelligent enough, I'm not worthy, and so forth. We tend to have a mind that is always kind of disparaging, fault-finding, dwelling on our failures and imperfections. That means a lack of metta. You've not, you not develop, you have no metta for yourself. But a metta for yourself means not dwelling in aversion. You're aware of weaknesses and faults and failures. You're not denying or saying, I love my weaknesses. I, I think my weaknesses are absolutely wonderful. <laughs> my faults. <laughs> I've heard people say that. I don't believe it. <clears throat> it's being aware of, of weaknesses and faults without dwelling in aversion on them, feeling guilty for not being perfect, uh, not living that kind of, ha- developing those mental uh, additives that are always being uh, um, averse because we find so, uh, many imperfections in our thoughts and emotions, in the way we look, in our habits, backgrounds, past. I mean, if you have done things in the past that you think are terrible, that you think you're weak, or you're something wrong with you, it's not very nice, and you hope nobody will ever find out that you're not perfect. You did something wrong. Well, as metta, it means that we don't proliferate like that anymore. Metta is a clearing of the mind, it's a clarity, uh, not dwelling in aversion on, a kindly attitude, a friendliness towards this body and mind. But it isn't a masking or a kind of just conditioning the mind to, to think nice sentimental thoughts about ourselves or about others. But when we develop this metta, this, this inner ease and, and peacefulness towards this, this very being, this, this formation here, and the mental formations that come and go in the mind, then we radiate this outward, this in ease to other beings. This is why when metta is, a, is spreading, they call the spreading of metta, is if we're at ease and at peace with ourselves, then we will be at ease and at peace with others, even the most awful beings, with the, with the most you know, evil beings. We can still be peaceful with. We aren't. We don't need to dwell in aversion, even on the most uh, mean and and disgusting beings. And when we can do this, then even the most violent and dreadful beings are affected by that. Like St. Francis of Assisi was famous for that kind of metta, in which wild animals and all that would, would draw near, weren't frightened because of this radiance of metta, of kindness. <clears throat> now the last one is uh, upeka, which means translated most commonly as equanimity, which means a kind of emotional balance in yourself, in which you you no longer it follows from the metta, from the developing of metta, then equanimity or humility are there. I mean, 
You're not getting caught up in the successes and failures of your life, in the happiness and suffering, good fortune and bad fortune. Like if you have no humility at all, no equanimity, you tend to, uh, when you're when you're successful, you you you're very you think, oh, I'm successful, I'm world success, I'm great, I'm, and you jump for joy, get caught up into that gladness, being a successful person. But then, when you fail, what do you do? I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm a failure, I don't deserve to live anymore, I think I will uh, kill myself. Depression. So you're kind of a helpless victim of fate if you have no equanimity, aren't you? Somebody praises you and they say, you're wonderful. And you say, whoopee, I'm wonderful. <laughs> somebody, somebody says, you're no good. You say, oh, I'm no good. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's um, a puppet on a string. You'll be manipulated by people if you have no equanimity. But if you if you have equanimity and this humility, then success, you know success, but you're not going to get carried away by it. Or failure. You recognize the failure, but you're not being you're not going to be carried away by failure, or by praise, or by criticism, or by uh good fortune or bad fortune or by happiness or suffering. You can observe, you can... that's the way life is. Sometimes we have successes and sometimes failures. Sometimes there's happiness, sometimes suffering. Sometimes uh, people praise us and sometimes they blame us. This is the way the world is. Don't expect it to be otherwise. Don't expect life to always be successful, happy, full of praise and fame and honors. Nor do you have to think that life is always going to be just a misfortune, full of misery and failure and depression. And recognize that these things alternate in our lives. We can't always be successful and we're not always failing. These are just conditions changing. And they're all impermanent. So we have equanimity toward these conditions because they're not self, they're not me, they're not mine. Now in metta and upeka, as you, this metta is a kind of an inner peace and ease which radiates outward. And upeka is an emotional balance within yourself, in which you learn from success and failure, praise and blame, happiness and suffering. But are not no longer just helpless victims of fate. Now these are the ten barometers of the Theravada system. The uh, These are, say, what we're developing now, aren't we, in our, in our life here. These are naturally developing as we live more mindfully. Not thinking, oh, this year I'm going to just develop dana, next year I'll develop sila, the next year I'll develop... <laughs> You see the stress on this proper attitude of living, acting in the right way. Not, you know, like some people think that, I don't know, they get the impression when I talk that I'm just saying you just kind of sit there and just say everything arises and passes away and the world blows up and you say everything's passing away. <laughs> Somebody comes into the room and starts cutting your heads off with a sword. I think, in permanent conditions, not me, not mine. That, 
That's not I'm trying to do that. Just try. <laughs> just see if you can do that. But this allows us to they act in the world in skillful ways to be that force in the society which is kind and gentle, considerate, wise, um, moral, charitable, patient, resolute, so forth. The society needs that a lot, it doesn't it? America, we really need that kind, those kind of people, those kind of beings. We need wise people kind, patient, gentle people. At a time where <coughs> great powers, there's great aggressive power being generated. <coughs> Very strong <coughs> powers. Aggressive, very masculine powers going out to got to protect ourselves and get rid of the enemy. Annihilate that which we don't like. And try to keep what we have for ourselves. But this this is a, a very gentle, more feminine kind of kind of power. Which is the only thing that will neutralize the other, will balance it out. Is it very being very patient, kind, humble? They don't doesn't sound like it, it can do very much, does it? I mean, we need to kill the people that are making the bombs. <laughs> Even the peace, people in the peace movement in Britain want to kill the people who are making bombs. It goes on and on, you know, you start killing the people who are making bombs and what happens. And what I had, I remember one weekend in Cambridge, this man was Ra- ranting about, you aren't doing anything for world peace. You're just sitting there, letting anything. They're going to blow up the world any moment. And he was he was ranting, and and I said, look, you come into this room, and you don't bring any peace with you. I could just feel, even before he said anything, his presence was aggressive. It was attacking. It was averse. It was critical. It was all those vibrations that cause war. He was vibrating it. He was, he was radiating that kind of aggression outward. <clears throat> Wasn't aware of it because he was caught up in his own fears and ambitions and self-conceit. Well, we, we're using the, the wisdom faculty to observe how things work. Now, in, in this retreat, observe what, how to balance and find a, a balance within yourself. How to learn to be at peace with yourself. Can you, can you be at ease with yourself? If you can't be at ease with yourself, then you can't very well expect the United States and Soviet Union to be peaceful. <laughs> you can't demand that someone else be peaceful or a whole nation of ignorant people have peace. That's asking the impossible if you cannot be peaceful. But first, you have to look and know what peace really is. It's not just something that a government can can, uh, bring. It's something that you, as an individual human being, has to do. If you want world peace, you have to bring it into your world. You have to know what it is. So in this way, in the practice of meditation, is you're learning to be at peace. Peaceful coexistence with this body, with the conditions of your mind, even the unpleasant ones, especially the unpleasant ones. And then you'll know what you're talking about when you're talking about peace. (laughs) And you'll also have a a great effect on the world. You have a good effect on the beings around you, on the society you live in. <coughs>